welcome to our Open Education Network's Pub 101 session for today. I see that some people are still streaming in from the waiting room, so um, I'll just take a moment to say hello and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Amanda Herford, and I'm the Scholarly Communications Director at PALNI, and I'm also serving on the Pub 101 Committee, and I'll be your host and facilitator today. And I don't know about you all, but I'm enjoying some spectacular, amazing spring weather out there. We have the red buds blooming and it's absolutely gorgeous. And I'm so happy that spring is finally here and apparently here to stay, hopefully. Um, so as I men mentioned, I'll be kind of the host today and I'll be handing it over to our speaker um, here in a moment. Um, but just a sort of a few housekeeping um, items. Um, I wanted to share a link to our orientation document. And this document is, as I'm sure you're aware, sort of our roadmap for our, yeah. our activities in these sessions. Um, and it includes things like our schedule and the links to the session slides and video recordings. So I definitely invite you to check that out. Um, so as I mentioned, um, again, I'll be handing it off to Jacqueline Frank here pretty soon. Um, she is the Instruction and Accessibility Librarian at Montana State University, and she's going to be talking with us today about accessibility. And I hope that we're able to have a really good conversation and hear some great tips and tricks from Jacqueline. Um, so we'll have lots of times for questions and conversation. And I hope that if some of you have things to share as well, that you'll feel comfortable um, adding to the topic in addition to our guest and that you'll, experience, you'll share your experience and resources with us. Um, so just a couple more housekeeping things. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be added to the YouTube uh, playlist for Pub 101. And I'll share that document or I'll show that link here in a sec. There you go. Um, so that is the link to the playlist where all of the other recordings will be found as well. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention is our community norms. We're definitely committed to providing a safe and friendly environment for you all for these sessions. So I wanted to make sure that you're aware of the community norms um, and that you'll review those and um, help us in creating this safe and constructive space to share information. So the community norms there are in the chat as well. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Jacqueline to talk to us about accessibility. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I am also going to post a link in the chat to today's slides. Um, those will be linked from the orientation document but are not yet. So uh, if you want the slides, there's the direct link. And I am going to share my screen and get my slides up. And start presenting. So I'm happy to be here today to talk about accessibility and inclusion in open educational resources. I am Jacqueline Frank, the Instruction and Accessibility Librarian, Montana State University. And today we're going to uh, briefly talk about some challenges. Uh, what it means to have an accessibility mindset and uh, kind of why accessibility matters in general. And then we're going to dig into some best practices, including some accessibility checkers that will help check those best practices, uh, some different document formats to be aware of for OER uh, when you are publishing OER, and then some more resource and training options as well. First, before we get into the challenges, um, you know, if you did, for those that had a chance to review unit one already, um, a lot of this is uh, covered, but we're kind of highlighting some of those areas uh, to pay attention to for accessibility. I do want to start out by acknowledging that there are quite a few different challenges and uh, First, accessibility often can be seen as an add-on or something to do at the end. Um, and so we're going to talk about trying to think about accessibility from the beginning and how that can ultimately help you through the process. It does take time to both learn about accessibility 
and then to create accessible materials. Ultimately, it never ends. 100% accessible doesn't exist, um, unfortunately. And so we will look at the best practices and uh, do try to do the best that we can. And it never ends because what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for someone else. So we kind of have to shift our thinking and just be aware of uh, the accessibility best practices. And, uh, and hopefully that will help us in the end. And then one of the biggest challenges is uh, the misconception that it doesn't have a big impact. So hopefully uh, when we see in the you know, why accessibility matters section that ultimately accessibility does help all users in the end and it does have a pretty big impact. So acknowledging some challenges. And uh, we do have three different polls throughout the presentation. And so I am, um, oh, but now my toolbar went away. Of course, I tried to practice this before. Let me see. Amanda, are you able to start the poll by chance? Let me look. I didn't. Ah, I found it. Here we go. I did. Oh, yes, looks like the poll is open. And uh, you, there are three different polls. You can, of course, answer all three of them if you would like. Um, we're just going to focus on the results for question one. What type of institution are you from? And we'll give you one more minute. Actually, it looks like almost everyone has participated. I'll give you a couple more seconds. And I will end the poll and share the results. It looks like most people are in a university or college setting. Uh, we have about 25% from community colleges and 4% uh, other. Interesting. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And Moving on, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about accessibility, universal design, and inclusive design. Ultimately, they mean somewhat different things. Uh, the definitions that are actually included in the Pub 101 Unit 1 are that universal design is the process of creating products that are usable by people with the widest range of abilities and operating within the widest possible range of situations. Inclusive design means that you're creating a lot of different ways for people to participate so that as many people as possible can feel as though they belong. And it doesn't necessarily mean designing one thing for all people. Accessibility, in contrast, often refers to the design of products, devices, services, or environments so as to be usable by people with disabilities. Ultimately, they all have a shared goal. Uh, they are all trying to help design content in a way that more users can access with more ease. So that's the main point that we wanna take away from this. And thinking about an accessibility mindset and why accessibility matters. Oh, and here's my poll number two. I thought this was before. Anyway, uh, poll number two, are you mostly supporting other textbook authors or are you authoring content yourself? And I will share those results. And it looks like most are supporting other textbook authors and 2% for authoring content yourself. Great. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. So jumping into the accessibility mindset, 
uh, one of the goals of creating open textbooks is that so they can be accessed by more people with fewer barriers. And therefore, we also want to follow accessibility best practices so that they can be accessible. And overall, about 19% of undergraduates report having a disability. 26% of people worldwide live with a disability. And if you really think about it, 100% will experience a disability at some point in your life if you are lucky enough to live long enough. And that, uh, that just means, and that's because accessibility can be permanent, temporary, or situational. So for example, um, we have an image here on the screen that shows the example of um, a permanent dis disability being if you only have one arm or one arm is physically disabled, but a temporary disability could be an arm injury or your arm is in a sling. And situational is if you are a new parent or you are carrying um, a child or maybe you are carrying a big box and therefore you only have uh, one other arm available to help. So there are lots of different ways that uh, disability can present itself in day-to-day -day life. And accessibility is a spectrum. There are many assistive technologies from wearing glasses or contacts all the way up to screen readers, mobility aids, hearing aids, and ultimately, which I mentioned before, what works for one person does not necessarily work for another person. So thinking about OER, one option is to provide as many options and formats that allows users to choose what works best for them. So uh, we will see some different formats for publishing OER, and uh, you can publish in multiple formats as well. And like I said, accessibility ultimately benefits everyone. So for example, some things that were created originally specifically for users with disabilities help everyone. Uh, for example, automatic door openers or curb cuts. Uh, curb cuts were created, uh, that's like in a sidewalk where the raised sidewalk then slopes down to the street level, for example. And that can be helpful for if you are pushing a stroller or a shopping cart. Um, automatic door openers can be helpful if you're carrying something, for example. And then uh, headers in documents, which we will see. Uh, they allow users to navigate by section and kind of see different areas of the document. Closed captioning allows users to view the content without sound. Maybe you're in a noisy environment without headphones or you're in a super quiet environment without headphones. The transcripts also allow users to read the content. And like I said, 100% um, of people will experience a disability at some point in life. So this ultimately benefits us all. Now we are going to dig into those accessibility best practices. And a lot of these were covered uh, in e unit one um, as well. And so if you want more information, you can go, uh, go back to unit one, uh, but we will highlight them here as well. And these polls, I thought they were before each section, but they're showing up after in each section. So I apologize for that we have our last poll here. How much accessibility knowledge and or experience do you have? Zero, low, moderate, or advanced? And I am going to share those results. It looks like about 50% of folks have a moderate level. 25% have a low level, 7% have zero, and then 15% have advanced knowledge, which is great. So please share your own knowledge or comments 
uh, in the chat as well. Jacqueline, while we're at a pause point, I yeah. thought I would go ahead and ask you a question from the chat. Great. Uh, Michael asks, when you mentioned disability, are you referring to physical disabilities or could they also include things that are hidden? Good question. They are also hidden. So both. Um, we are talking about physical disabilities, but also um, they're the majority of disabilities are actually um, invisible, and those can include cognitive disabilities, for example, um, with dyslexia or ADHD and PTSD um, can also be categorized as disabilities, and so it is really across the spectrum. Um, but yes, good points to make. Lots of them are invisible as well. Let me know at any point if there are if there are more questions. Okay, so digging into accessibility best practices. First, a note about who is ultimately responsible for making sure the content is accessible. It comes down to uh, the creator or the author of the content is generally responsible for accessibility. However, when we are helping to publish, uh, publishers also want to help publish accessible content, which means kind of knowing what to look for and then being able to provide resources or guidance to authors if needed. And so this is, can be, you know, ultimately this is a challenge as well, um, figuring out who is going to fix something if something needs to be fixed. Um, but knowing the best practices will help us know what to look for. And then we will also provide resources so that we can support um, authors along the way. These best practices come from WCAG 2.1 now. I thought I had updated that. Um, and this is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And we are going to look at the best practices for structuring headings, including meaningful hyperlinks, considering color, adding captions and transcripts, and alt text for images which I know at least quite a few of you have already looked at because there was a homework assignment that um, people have already submitted ahead of time for alt text. Headings is one of the most important things to know about for OER. And headings are a, ultimately a formatting tool but they are used to help separate sections of a document. They help users navigate and either visual users to see the visual formatting of the headings, or they can also be used by people with a screen reader and you can jump to different headings within the document. You apply headings in an outline format and they kind of act as a map for the textbook or the document. So if we're thinking about a book uh, with multiple chapters, for example, the book title would be heading one. And then all of the chapter titles would be heading twos. And then if there are subsections within a chapter, those would be heading threes. So each um, under a heading two, the next heading level for a subsection would be heading three, but they can go back up, um, for example, and then the next chapter would again be a heading two. Meaningful hyperlinks. Meaningful hyperlinks means that you tell the user where the link is going uh, rather than just pasting in the full URL. And also avoiding using click here as a link and let the link be the title of the content itself. So for example, um, if, you, if I was saying in a document, more information can be found at the MSU library website, 
I would put the link behind MSU Library website. Uh, and so that link, so the text is actually the link itself. Jacqueline, can we go back to headings real yeah. quick for a question? Yes, please. Um, there's a question here about headings. So when you say heading two, do you mean in terms of the coding? So is this something that's sort of under the hood or not? Good question. Yes, this is under the hood. Um, and for example, in Word to, uh, and oops, let me go back again. Many times um, you will select the text that would be heading to, for example, the, sorry, I keep clicking with my mouse. Uh, so you would select the chapter title in your document. And um, in Word, for example, at the top in the ribbon on the home tab, there would be a button to click to make it formatted as a heading two. It does come with some formatting options, but you can update how that formatting appears. And that is similar um, in lots of different authoring tools and technologies. Um, so yes, it is, it is behind the scenes, but when you select it, it also um, can make it change the formatting so it's also visible um, on the front end. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. I did pull up the chat as well, so I'll try to kind of pay attention if I see if I see other ones. But yes, please stop me along the way. And also, if you are uh, if you do know specific coding, you can do it in the back end with code as well. But lots of times, um, it is on the front end user interface, and they make it fairly easy. We talked about hyperlinks and also considering color. This is mainly about color contrast. And so we want to use high color contrast for both text and diagrams and charts. And then we also don't want to rely on color alone to convey meaning. And what that means is for someone who is colorblind, for example, we wouldn't want to just change the color of text to highlight um, an important note, for example. So if you wanted to highlight something that was really important, don't just change it to be the color red, for example. You would want to bold it and change the color if you would like, but the bold um, would help highlight it as well. And then similar with diagrams and charts, using color can be fine, but it is also good to just make sure that the colors uh, are different enough so that if they were viewed in grayscale or if someone was colorblind, they could still denote the difference between um, either the line color or the bar chart color. Um, and things like that. So there is an option usually to include grayscale diagrams, and that is one way to check um, and make sure that they are uh, can be di distinguished without the color alone. Captions. I see a question. Um, in a math course, if you were creating a quiz that had a pie chart or bar chart, how would you describe the chart without giving away the question's answer? Hmm. Oh, good, good question. Um, ultimately, I'm trying to think about, I'm trying to think about that one. Um, 
The short answer is I'm not 100% sure. It would kind of depend on the question. So um, if, but if you could see it, if you could see the bar chart, oh, then it, and if that is telling you the answer, then describing it um, is basically trying to describe what you can see. So the short answer, um, oh, and I see another, another comment, perhaps create a table with the data and add a table header and row. Um, and that's less interpretation and more data presentation. Yes, um, that is a great recommendation as well. But ultimately, they can be they can be tricky, which we will see. So coming back to captions, uh, captions benefit people with hearing impairments without access to audio. They benefit folks who speak English as a second language. They can help others if they are viewing the video in a noisy or quiet environment. And you can generate automatic captions for videos using YouTube. And then there are lots of other captioning software. Uh, YouTube includes it for free, uh, but there are other uh, captioning softwares available. I know here at the Montana State University Library, MSU has a captioning software that is available for everyone in the university, including students. So uh, for those of you at, actually um, any institution, you can check to see if they have another option as well. For some recording tips for captions, if you speak clearly, slowly, and close to the microphone, those automatic captions will be much cleaner. You should go back and edit the captions and look quickly um, at them. And that can take a variable amount of time, honestly. But if you are aware of using a microphone and getting good, clear audio from the beginning, that will make the automatic captions much better um, from almost every software available. Transcripts also benefit people with vision impairments, and they are a separate written document of the audio. They don't have to be verbatim accounts of the spoken word, so they can be written beforehand. And one of the biggest benefits is that they can be searchable by all users. So if you wanted to, if you remembered someone talking about um, headings, for example, in a recorded video. You could go to the transcript, search for headings, and then find that section. Alt text for images. This is a written description of an image. It is read by screen readers in place of the image. And it is also displayed if an image file doesn't load properly. Sorry. So uh, it can also be displayed when the user has chosen not to view images. Uh, and so alt text shows up in, in many different ways. And all text guidelines. This is just a brief snapshot. There is a whole like book of guidelines for alt text. Um, I am not personally an alt text expert. I know some of the general guidelines, um, but I will say alt text can, there are lots of different nuances to it and it can be challenging um, to figure out exactly, you know, the best way to represent the alt text. So one of the biggest things is to consider the context. Is it purely decorative? Is um, sometimes there are, you know, horizontal lines in between different content, but it shows up 
actually as an image. And so you can mark things as decorative. And that means if you are using a screen reader um, or the image didn't load, it would just skip it completely. But if it provides context or information, then you need to include alt text. You want to be as concise as possible. Generally for a photo, for example, this is one or two sentences. You don't want to repeat information that's provided elsewhere. So if the if in the text you mentioned a yellow zebra and then you had an image of a yellow zebra, then you wouldn't necessarily need to repeat that. But you want to focus on the added information that it is presenting and then be as objective as possible. Don't try to interpret or analyze and use the same writing style and terminology as the surrounding text. So if we're thinking about writing an open textbook, for example, if it is very formal, you would want to also include alt text in a formal writing style. If it was more informal, then your alt text could be more informal in tone. Charts and graphs are much more difficult, I will admit. And ultimately, they, the alt text for charts and graphs can be longer. You don't have to stick to the one to two sentences uh, for something like a chart that is super complicated. It is best to link to the full data table from the text because the full data table can, um, tables can also be made accessible. And then if the chart is, you know, compiling a table of data and showing percentages, for example, then the alt text might include those percentages. And we will, uh, if we have time, we can look at the alt text homework assignment and view a few of the alt text um, entries that you guys created. And if not, if you don't get there, I will be going into that document um, and providing feedback um, as a reply to your different comments as well. So I mentioned the prior homework assignment. Um, if you haven't done this, uh, it is a interesting exercise to go and try your hand at writing some alt text for one of the images um, in this example. And there are more alt text guidelines under the accessibility section in the Hub 101 Unit 1. Okay. Now we are going to jump into some different open textbook formats. Ah, and I see it. Sorry, I'm just checking chat again. Um, one of you shared this resource for um, a guide for writing alt text and image descriptions. And, uh, and that is super helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so there are many different document formats. And when we're thinking about OER, there are many different types of documents that might be included from PDF to EPUB, audiobooks, press books, um, many more. And they do all have different accessibility considerations, uh, even though the accessibility best practices for creating the original document um, are the same. So for example, enlarging text and um, options for reflowing the content or multiple columns, 
things like that uh, are different depending on the final output. So for example, EPUB or online and HTML web versions of a document are reflowable, meaning that if you change the font size, for example, um, it will reflow into the width of the screen that you are looking at it on. They also support vector images that resize, again, based on the screen that you are looking at, versus a PDF, which means portable document format. And the good thing is that PDFs are independent of software, hardware, operating systems, so they can be viewed on almost any device, but it maintains the original visual layout. So if you zoom in, rather than the text reflowing to be within the width that you are viewing it, um, it will just zoom into a small piece and then you will have to scroll side to side um, to, to view at the whole width of the document. They do have some benefits though. They are great to be available offline and they're also good for printing. So the takeaway here is that almost always, wherever you are publishing or creating the original document, um, or if you are helping someone else publish an OER, wherever they originally created the document, you can usually save or output into multiple formats. And so it's best to just provide as many options as possible. I'm gonna click on this link and I believe I shared my screen in a way that it should be showing you um, the link to an open textbook here in the open textbook library. And this page, um, if you can see it, shows a, an open textbook for understanding document accessibility. And there are multiple formats from an online HTML version. It's available as an ebook. It's available as ODF, open document format. It's also available as PDF or XML. So this allows users to choose different options based on their needs. So this is a good example. And now I am going to wait until my controls go away and click back to my slides. I do want to share some different accessibility checkers. So it is great to be aware of all of these best practices and um, trying to implement them throughout the process if you are authoring it yourself. Um, if you're thinking about these things up front, it can help save time. But if you are helping other authors who have created OER and you're helping publish them, then there are some accessibility checkers that you can use at the end after the fact um, and have authors use them as well to check their own content. So for example, Word um, and for that matter, PowerPoint, all Microsoft Office documents now have an accessibility checker. And in Word, you can open your document, click on file, check for issues, check accessibility. Some versions have a check accessibility button um, in a different location, but all should have it um, in this location as well. And then um, a sidebar pops up and it, you can click on any error to get instructions on how to fix the issue. There is also a PDF accessibility checker um, in Adobe Pro. Adobe Pro is the um, upgraded option. And here at MSU, for example, they have a campus-wide subscription. So check if your institution um, has Adobe Pro. And 
Um, there is, uh, so in Adobe Pro, open your document. And if needed, click the action wizard on the toolbar by clicking more tools. And then under the action wizard, there is an option to make accessible. And it brings up a pop-up box and you click through all of the different options. It will automatically highlight any images, for example, and prompt you to put in alt text if there is an alt text already. Um, and it will take you through headings. Um, and in Adobe, it will also do an important step called OCR, optical character recognition which um, takes the pdf from an image and it tries and it recognizes the text so that the text can be searchable as well and for online resources and html for example there are online accessibility checkers the WAVE accessibility checker is the one that I usually use. You can go to wave.webaim.org and you can either paste in the URL um, directly to that site and it will check the page for you. Or alternatively, you can um, use a plugin, which is often a browser extension and then it gives you um, any page that you are viewing online. You can click the plugin button and it will pull up a sidebar uh, with accessibility errors and suggestions for you. Another one is the Totally browser extension. And, um, and that one, again, it, uh, whatever page you are on, it would bring up a um, button for the totally extension and you click on that and it pulls up a sidebar for you and highlights um, different errors or suggestions for you. And there are many more. So if you have another one that you like um, or use a lot, please share that in the chat as well. I see a question here. Where did you say the accessibility checker in Adobe is? So when I'm familiar with on the tools has an accessibility check, but it doesn't have make it accessible for me. Good question. There are two options within Adobe Pro. The one that I like to use, um, you may have to click under more tools and then add the action wizard because, um, and that brings up a different option and kind of walks you through each step. There is a separate option for accessibility check and that just takes you to the end uh the end screen if you will and so it's the same results it's checking the same things um, but if you use the action wizard specifically it kind of helps walk you through the steps to fix things a little in a little bit easier way i hope that makes sense and didn't confuse folks more And I also saw the question about the homework and it looks like Karen, uh, Karen helped answer that one. So thank you. A note about the accessibility checkers. They are great, helpful tools and um, they are very useful. I use them quite often myself, but they don't check everything. Um, color contrast, for example, I believe it's now included in the Microsoft Accessibility Checker, but it wasn't initially included. 
um, for example. So, and it also doesn't check if headings are used in the first place. If you do use headings, it will check the order of headings. Um, but if there are just no headings used, it doesn't check that. And uh, in reading order, so for example, if you have multiple columns and maybe on a textbook, for example, you have a you know, highlighted section or a call out section that has a brief blurb about um, something extra. The reading order is the order in which the content will be read out if using a screen reader. And uh, so it can check, it will automatically apply a reading order, but it doesn't, it can't know if it actually makes sense. Uh, so if there are multiple columns and at the end, there is a paragraph that continues on the next page. It might do a call out and read the information in that call out kind of in an awkward place. So that's maybe in the middle of another paragraph. So there are, um, so this is just one example of how accessibility checkers are great, but they only go so far and um, they can be used as a great tool to look at the accessibility of a document, but ultimately um, it doesn't replace a human knowing and understanding what these best practices are and then trying to implement them. Okay, I'm gonna come back to uh, this one for just a second. Um, so again, because accessibility checkers don't check everything, that is why having a good understanding of these best practices, or at least an awareness of the best practices, um, can really help. So looking at a document and realizing if headers are used or not um, can, be, can be really helpful as well. Okay. There is also a comment in here about two other accessibility checkers. The Axe browser extension, that is a good one. I have used that one. And there is a color contrast analyzer. Thank you for sharing this one um, as well. It, so I mentioned here in the list that the built-in accessibility checkers might not check color contrast, but there are specific tools that will look at color contrast. Um, and so you can download that color contrast analyzer, for example. And while you are viewing your document, you can uh, pull up the analyzer, click on two different colors, and it will give you um, an, a result or if it passes the standards. Um, and so, yeah, it's really cool. It has like a dropper tool where you click one color and then you click the background color um, and it will tell you what levels it passes. And uh, there are, the one that I have used, um, the, the one included in the chat, it is available as a the download application. So I have not used it on a mobile device. I don't know if, that is possible actually. Please tell me in the chat if you know. Um, but on a desktop computer, you download it um, and it's a specific application. And so you can view whatever document you are looking at and then open the color contrast analyzer and it brings up a screen um, that then you can choose the different colors in the background. So thank you for sharing those. Okay, so we covered a lot of different um, best practices and we barely scratched the surface. Uh, so as you can probably tell, there are many more details behind each one of these best practices, including specifically how to implement them, how to use them, 
And um, if you do have any questions um, in the future about like, how do I apply a heading, for example, or how do I hyperlink text? Um, how do I use the color contrast analyzer? I would be happy to provide more like step-by-step -step instructions for anyone who, who would like that. But ultimately today it was kind of about awareness about these different accessibility best practices. And there are a lot. So I really wanna highlight the self-care portion and just you know try to be kind to yourself. Perfection is not the goal. And ultimately it can't be the goal because we know that 100% accessible doesn't exist. So um, trying to do the best that we can, trying to uh, you know, learn about one additional thing each time can be helpful to slowly build up your knowledge and experience. And ultimately, you know, we all in life in general uh, should, should help ourselves uh, practice self-compassion and try to just be kind to yourself. Um, and therefore, um, extend that out to others. So if we're helping, you know, publish, we can help try to facilitate this for other authors, but realizing that there is a lot uh, to understand and we are all coming at it with different levels of experience. Lastly, there are more resources and training options. There are tons. Um, there is another comment in the chat with a very long list of tools, um, which is great. And there are specific resources linked from Hub 101 Unit 1. Um, I mentioned there are more guidelines for creating alt text and image descriptions. There is a full accessibility toolkit and checklist for accessibility. And um, we also have instructions for creating accessible documents. And that gets into more of the step-by-step -step, um, instructions for applying these best practices. But now um, I want to make sure, give at least a few minutes of time uh, for questions. And uh, if you would be willing to provide feedback as well. Thank you, Jacqueline, for all of your knowledge and for sharing your experience with us today. Um, like she mentioned, we are able to take questions for the next few minutes, so you can feel free to use the chat like we have been doing, or you can raise your hand and I can call on you. I do appreciate folks sharing um, comments and best practices in the chat as well. That's really helpful. Yes, there are, there are many different resources out there. Um, there might even be, uh, you know, resources that were created or disseminated from your specific institution or university, uh, but there are lots of resources out there on, in general, from many different sources. WebAIM.org is one of the leaders for um, accessibility, and they have lots of good information as well. Can you talk just a little bit about your feedback form? Yes, feedback form here um, is, is a kind of a generic feedback form that we uh, use, but it we try to offer this at the end of um, each of our sections or workshops so that we can uh, determine if you learned something, um, if it was useful, and also um, a comment option if you want to provide any specific feedback um, for us as well or suggestions. But we try to use this in a way that will help us improve our instruction. And is there a way to translate a publication between multiple 
formats or do you just have to recreate it in each? Good question. Yes, I will share this feedback link in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, I got it. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. So translating a publication between multiple formats. Generally, yes, there is an option to do this. So the hardest time is when you only have a PDF. If you only have a PDF, there are ways to convert it, um, but it can be a lot harder. But if you're starting with most other formats, um, then you can often save in multiple formats. So Pressbooks is a common platform for publishing OER, um, and you can output it, the end document into multiple formats um, as well. And so the short answer is it kind of depends on your starting document. It's hardest with the PDF, um, but there should be other options to translate um, or output the publication into different formats. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. While folks are thinking of any final questions they might have, I just shared in the meeting chat a link to the class notes document. And this is where you can um, add additional comments that you have from today's session or um, just sort of comments that you'd like to share. And those notes will be reviewed um, but before the next session um, and we'll answer any outstanding questions. And I also included a link to the feedback form in the chat as well. Great. Um, and I will, I did want to mention um, again, the alt tag homework, since we didn't have um, a whole lot of time to go back and review that together. I will be looking at your comments and trying to provide um, some feedback in that document. So if you want to try your hand at the alt text homework, um, that is, um, is linked from the orientation document, I know, and probably elsewhere. Well, I'll go ahead and close this out. Um, I wanted to take a moment to thank Jacqueline for her presentation today and her expertise. Um, we definitely appreciate you um, coming to the meeting today and telling us about all of those great tools. Um, and for everyone else who also um, contributed in the chat and otherwise, um, it's really wonderful that we're able to share together and learn from each other and Again, with that key takeaway that we are not alone in figuring out how to do this. Um, we're all working together to figure out how to support authoring um, open textbooks with authors or creating open textbooks. Um, so again, feel free to use the class notes and um, we will see you next week. Thanks again. Thank you. And don't hesitate to reach out for more questions or details about any of this. Thank you. <laughs>